welcome to the Stranger Times podcast. I'm author CK slash Queeve McDonnell and insert shameless plug here for this charming man coming out on February the 17th. Oops, I've just realised I've never bothered finishing writing this script. Anyway, that's the hardcore marketing done. Now on with the story. This episode's tale is called Beauty and the Beast and it makes a departure from the stories that went before it in that it is the first one ever that I wrote with a very specific narrator in mind. And what a narrator, ladies and gentlemen. Janice Connolly is basically a national treasure. I don't care what nation you're from, all of the nations should treasure her. Uh, she is a superb actress who has numerous credits to her name on both stage and screen. But how I first got to know her was as a woman behind the wonderful comic creation that is the character Barbara Noyce. Now, how can you describe Babs? Imagine, if you will, a suburban housewife from Birmingham who more often than not ends her gigs by stage diving and crowd surfing. It is an absolutely joyous comedy experience and she has quite rightly got a cult following that is growing by the day. A Barbara Nice show is, honest to God, one of the most uplifting and funny things you could ever possibly experience. And who couldn't use that in their life these days? When Jana said she'd be willing to narrate a story for me, I was thrilled. As an author, writing something to be read by a particular person is a new thing for me. And I have to say, I really enjoyed the experience. I was able to take chances with the tone of voice, as I knew that in the masterful hands of Janice Connolly, it would come out how I hoped, if not better. I really loved doing this, and after it turned out so well, I'm definitely going to try doing something similar again. I hope you enjoy it, and as always, do let us know any feedback you have, either through the the Twitter, the social media, the emails, all of that stuff. If you're not on the mailing list, by the way, go to strangertimes.com, sign up there, you'll get monthly-ish updates and you will get yourself a short story collection but all that is for another time now just sit back and relax in the company of janice connolly bem which is an official she's basically she should be a dame in fact screw it as far as i'm concerned she is a dame ladies and gentlemen please sit back and relax and enjoy dame janice connolly reading beauty and the beast The hat trick of heartbreak, that's what I call it. Well, it's not every day you lose a fella, a best friend and a business all in one go. But that's what's happened to me. Thinking back on it, what annoys me the most is that I didn't see it coming. Our mum always said to me, she said, Jackie, you're far too trusting of people. Maybe I am. But even now, after all I've been through, I'd rather be that way than the other way. Going through life, not trusting the people around you, thinking the worst, always watching your back, no thank you. Naive I might be, but I'll tell you what, there's a lot worse things you can be. Like, for example, my ex, or that hussy. Of the three things I lost, the business was definitely the one that hurt the most. I'd started the glam van from nothing. Mobile beautician and hairdressing services for the Greater Manchester area. That's what it said on my business card. And in the last 20 years, I've seen an awful lot of competitors come and go, but the glam van always did the business. And do you know why? Well, make no mistake, the technical side isn't easy. No chuffing way. You should see some of the rescue jobs I've had to do over the years when people ended up with bleeding eyebrows or the same shade as an umpa lumpa. But no, how you keep a business going for that long is being good with people. Relationships, that's what's important. And there's plenty of hairdressers and beauticians. When somebody has to avail themselves of a mobile service rather than just going somewhere, then there's usually a good reason. You know, people with health problems, old dears who can't get out anymore or can't leave the house because they're carers for somebody else. You know, there's always a story. I had one lady who was one of them agoraphobics. Poor thing had a panic attack if she tried to step outside the front door. When somebody invites you into their home, it's a sacred trust. I mean, it's as much about the companionship as it is the treatment or the new hairdo. And when you do the job well, when you can see the confidence somebody gains from feeling good about themselves, from liking what they see in the mirror, well, you know, that's what kept me going. And I built up a good business too. Did I make as much money as I could? No. 
Darren did the accounts and he was always on at me because some of my regulars didn't pay much or, in one case, did so through the medium of inedible fruitcakes. But the other customers evened them out. Plus, I got the odd big payday, like a wedding, and there's no higher compliment than somebody trusting you on their day of days. Every morning, I'd load up the van and I'd be happy to go to work, and there aren't many people who can say that, are there? In contrast, Darren's an electrician, always complaining about it. Our people expected him to work miracles. To be honest, I think they just expected him to work electricity. But I've long had a sneaking suspicion he isn't good at it. He seems to get shocked a lot. And our Christmas tree caught on fire that one time. I liked my job, though. And that's why it was tough to give it up for a while, after I needed to recover from a hysterectomy. But, you know, such is life. And hand on heart, I thought I was lucky to have Carol there. We'd been mates for years and I'd sort of taken her under my wing a couple of years previous, you know, shown her the ropes. She was my apprentice, really, although we never called it that. I suppose you could say in hindsight she'd always been ambitious. We were at school together and she went after Johnny Marsh and bagged him, married into that Marsh money. They had that thermal underwear business. Then three years ago it went under. They blame global warming. Said people didn't need warm undies as much. But I'm not sure that's how it works. She'll claim differently. But Carol wanted out as soon as a bankruptcy meant the money was all gone. And Johnny's revelation was just a handy excuse for her to play the victim. The revelation in question was him informing the world that he was Esther Ranson. Drag queen extraordinaire. He'd been keeping it secret, mainly because Carol said it was a hard no when he told her about his desire to do it years ago. I only found out about that after the fact. He kept it quiet for years, living in fear, because she said if he ever did anything about it, she'd divorce him and seek custody of the money. Then the money left home and Johnny got a peculiar kind of freedom. Personally, I say good luck to him. I snuck in and saw him do gigs in the village a few times. He's pretty good. Does a belting routine to the song, that's life. I mean, a real showstopper, that is. And I gave him a few makeup tips and showed him how to keep the wigs looking like actual hair. You know, I'm nothing if not adaptable. And he was a different fella after the split. He went from church mouse quiet to blossoming into a joyful peacock. All in all, a wonderful advert for the benefits of bankruptcy and divorce. Carol, on the other hand, took it hard. She ended up moving back in with her mum and they'd never got on. I tried to be supportive and that's why I gave her a job. She wasn't great with the customers, to be honest, but she needed the work and it was nice to have company in the van. I'm not going to lie, I was a little bit nervous when she took over... But I had to take the time off and she knew all the technical stuff by that point. Still, I do wish I'd paid more attention to the business. Darren and her kept telling me everything was fine. I should just rest, not worry about it. After I had my setback, which meant three months off became six, it was Darren's idea to give Carol a slice of the business. Ten percent. You know, as a thank you. And we even talked about getting a second van when I came back. You know, expanding. Then, the week before I'm about to resume work, Darren surprises me with a spa weekend for my birthday. Says I should have somebody waiting on me for a change. I should have been suspicious there and then because Darren's never thoughtful. Sure enough, I come back and he's gone. Moved out, shacked up with Carol in a fancy flat down spinning fields. The weekend away was just a ruse so he could move his bloody snooker table out. Turns out they'd been meeting up behind me back and she'd been giving him treatments that were very definitely not part of the standard package. I couldn't believe it. And that was just the start. They said they had a controlling interest in the business seen as Darren owned half plus Carol's bit. So she was keeping the van, the website and the work phone with all the customer numbers in it. I tried to kick up a fuss, but they'd planned it well, I'll give them that. 
I was going to have to get lawyers and fight the old thing. Only, you know, that takes time and money, neither of which I had. And they made me an offer of five grand for my share. Five grand, can you believe it? Scandalous. So there I was. Carol was welcome to the treacherous bastard, but that business had been my life's work. I started asking about, you know, feeling like a right idiot for not paying more attention. And of course, despite the promises I'd been made, Carol had dropped all of the regulars who weren't big payers and kept all the lucrative jobs. The van was the only transportation I had and the gear in it was worth a lot. I'd invested over the years, nothing but the best, I always said. And now I had no transport, no phone numbers, no gear and no customers, bar some people who couldn't pay. At a low point, I actively considered finding the pair of cheating buggers and bludgeoning them to death with an inedible fruitcake. So, as they say, cut to three months later. I'm sitting at home on the sofa, shouting at loose women on the TV. Most days I'm only getting dressed at all because I feel bad if little Rory, my Yorkshire Terry, doesn't get his walk. Darren came round once and Rory bit him. At least he's one loyal man in my life. My house is up for sale as I can't afford my half of the mortgage. My lawyer keeps telling me we've got a strong case, but his office is out the back of a butcher's in Fallowfield, so I'm a bit sceptical. He's all I can afford, but I've got a sneaking suspicion that most lawyers don't need to deliver pizza on the side to make ends meet. Friends drop over to see I'm doing, encouraging me to get back out there. I could get a job in a salon, everybody said. I probably could. Oh, I like being my own boss, being mobile, driving about, seeing the world, or at least all of it inside the M60. Besides, if I'm being honest, the whole thing's left me feeling humiliated. I wanted to bury myself in the sofa with a box of Quality Street and hide away from the world I knew. And I did. Until one day, the world I didn't know came knocking on my door. Yvonne Braithwaite is a bit of a Manchester institution. Going back centuries, the Braithwaite women, so it's told, have been famous for having the gift. They can speak to the dead. Which, to be fair, I suppose we all can. But the Braithwaites get responses, which is a big difference. Yvonne's lovely, but a bit odd. I suppose all of the Braithwaite women really were probably a little bit odd, but she's a different kind of odd. Because she doesn't want anything to do with the family tradition. She doesn't want to do seances and all that. She's a hairdresser. To be exact, and I'm honestly not being mean here, she is the worst hairdresser in Manchester. I had regular customers and my job was to fix what Yvonne had done. The reason people went to her was, despite herself, she still got messages from the other side and she passed them on while she worked. Sort of like the ordinary chat you get at the hairdressers, only a couple of the people involved are dead. People go to her just to check the nana's doing all right and they just hope for the best on the hair front. I knew Yvonne, but we weren't close. We'd sat at the same table at the Northwest Hair and Beauty Awards a couple of years ago and got fairly hammered. I invited Yvonne in for a cup of tea and as I'm brewing up, she says, so you've lost everything. This is a thing about people who talk to the dead a lot. They do lose a bit of their touch with the living. I confirmed I had and she says, listen, I might have a line on some very well-paying work for you. Well, I'm intrigued but suspicious. My first thought was if she thinks I'm doing escorting. Well, it's sort of flattering at my age, but I'm, I'm not Nicky from Coronation Street and I don't think it does suit me as a job. She says it isn't that, but then she sort of edges around what it actually is. Eventually, she says, look, you've always struck me as a very open-minded person. And I said, well, I'd like to think so. You know, I'd take people to find them. The glam van was always there for all, regardless of creed, persuasion or inclination. She says, Jackie, how would you feel about doing some beautician work for some unusual people? It was the way she said that word, unusual, that gave me pause. 
I didn't think it was drag queens or anything like that because bar anything else, Johnny had dropped around a bottle of wine a few months ago and he'd mentioned that unfortunately there was a glut of people providing these services for them thanks to all them programmes on the telly. Anyway, Yvonne doesn't really explain much other than to ask me if she drops over tomorrow, could I come with her to do a job? At this point I was that curious so I said yeah because you know I wanted to know what it was. She then gives me 200 quid and says... Pop out in the morning, get a load of waxing stuff. I told her that was far too much, but she said, get a lot, with the emphasis on a lot. So the next day she comes by about 11 o'clock and drives me and my gym bag full of waxing treatments off to this grand house past Nutsford. I mean, it looks like a stately home. Yvonne leads me inside through this big entrance hall into a room where the curtains are closed, the lights are off. And there's this lady sitting in the corner. I can't see her, but she sounds dead posh, you know, like downtown Abbey, only real. And she's introduced as Lady Winifred. And we sit down and have a pretty stilted conversation. Yvonne makes the tea. And after about 20 minutes and some very nice biscuits, Lady Winifred edges the conversation to the air of confidentiality. I reckoned I knew where we were heading, so I said, look, Winnie, you don't have to worry about me. Silly as it sounds, I've always viewed my position as somewhere between a doctor and a lawyer. Hippocratic oath meets attorney-client privilege sort of thing. I've never been a blabber and I'm not about to start now. She seems pretty reassured by this and she steps forward. She's hairy. I don't mean, you know, a bit of a tash. I mean, all over Rory the Yorkie hairy. Right, OK, well, where shall we start? I said. It's sort of odd how odd works, isn't it? Like, when you're confronted with something unusual, it doesn't take that long before it just becomes another thing. We get cracking, and after the first couple of goes, the whole thing just becomes a problem that needs solving. You know, like a dodgy fake tan or split ends. We work solidly for six hours, with breaks every two for tea and biscuits. Winnie must have one hell of a pain threshold because I'm waxing and pulling like I'm taking up carpet. Every time I pull a strip off, she sort of growls. Eventually she loosens up and she's actually a really good laugh. Turns out she's got a big do coming up. A once in a lifetime sort of deal and that's what all this is about. She says she has to pass. That was the phrase she used, to pass. And I said, sod that, you're not going to pass. You're going to get an A+. plus. <laughs> she laughed at that and opened a bottle of wine. By the end of the day, when Yvonne comes back to pick me up, I was aching all over. I can only imagine how Winnie felt. Still, she's a new woman and thoroughly thrilled about it. And Yvonne drops me at home. When she does, she hands me an envelope stuffed with cash. I mean, two weeks pay easy. She says, if I'm willing to do more unusual work, there's plenty crying out for it. I said, absolutely. And that, silly as it sounds, is how it all started. Next week, Yvonne calls and says she's got me three more clients and that having explained my situation to Winnie, her ladyship would like to give me an interest-free loan to set myself back up in business. And before you know it, I've got my own brand new van, the house is off the market and forget local... I've got offers of work coming in from all over the country. Like I said, odd is odd. When I start working with these people, I begin noticing as I'm walking about in everyday life that when you know what to look for, there's a whole lot of people who aren't anywhere close to ordinary. The more you see it, the more you get used to it. I don't ask questions, but the customers talk to me. There are people called the folk which is really a catch-all for all kinds that don't fit into normal. A lot of them can pass, some not so much. Some, with my help, can go from category B to category A. Every job is different. I mean, it's the kind of thing you always say, but now every job really is different, very different. There's a man over by Leeds has nails that are sharp as a razor and strong as blooming steel. We try a few things and eventually, with the help of an industrial sander and one of them welding masks, we get it done. And then there's a young girl with scales on her face, which, after a lot of trial and error, we figure out how to conceal. 
I'm doing a lot of eyebrow work which is far more challenging than normal because the number of eyes involved aren't the standard too. I had to groom the coat of a talking bulldog after he got covered in paint due to what he said was somebody handling the truth poorly. He offers to marry me. But I explain I'm still going through a divorce and I'm not dating right now. Also, I would imagine Rory would get jealous. I'm working with all manner of wigs, makeup, stuff that isn't technically makeup. I've got acid, polyfiller, sculpting clay in the back of the van. In fact, I had to upgrade to a bigger van because I needed so much stuff. I was able to do that and pay off Winnie in no time at all because business is booming. More importantly, I'm inventing treatments, coming up with solutions that aren't in any book and honestly, I'm loving my work. The best part was always making people feel better about themselves and I've never seen people as happy with the results as I was seeing every day. And speaking of happy, almost a year to the day after the heartbreak hat trick, I'm just finishing off a shopping spree at the Trafford Centre, my birthday's coming up, and treating myself. Business is good and I'm honestly happier than I've been in years. Then who do I meet on my way out of the car park? You guessed it, Darren and Carol. They don't see me at first because they're too busy arguing. They're on the up escalator, I'm on the down. And what did I say to him, you ask? Nothing. All I did was smile. Carol clocked me first and then Darren and just kept on smiling as I could see Carol checking out the shops I'd been to and the new Louis Vuitton bag I was rocking. Honestly, I'm not really into fancy things, but just this once I did let myself get carried away. Carol, though. I could see the little cash register totting up behind her eyes and she looked angrier and angrier as the numbers got bigger. It's true what they say. Living really is the best revenge. Honestly, by this point, I've become too focused on my new business to worry about them. And when you realise the world is so much bigger and more exciting than you could have possibly imagined, your problems do rather shrink in comparison. Not that I was letting them off the hook, because it turns out my lawyer might smell a lamb, but he's a wolf in sheep's clothing. Or at least he's good at checking paperwork. It seemed Carol didn't own 10% of the glam van after all, because Darren forgot to sign a form. We're suing them for all manner of stuff and all of a sudden they've got a great big old legal bill coming. Then I may have heard that Carol did a facial peel on a local councillor that peeled a lot more than it was supposed to. So it looks like I'm not their only legal trouble. Karma is a bitch. And as it turns out, a red-faced one whose husband works for the Crown Prosecution Service. So, life is good. And my customers are generally lovely. Generally. Not everyone, though. There was one. I was going to say it was an unusual job, but then, as I mentioned, they're all pretty unusual. I got approached by this nice lad called Darius. He said his dad was going to need a bit of a spruce up and wouldn't mind giving him a shave and a haircut. I said, yeah, sure, no problem. Now, I know how this will sound, but he apologised and explained that his dad was somewhere secret, so would I mind if he drove me there and could I wear a blindfold? I'm not a complete lemon, so I rang Yvonne and said, look, is this on the up and up? As I've got no desire to end up in a true life crime documentary on Channel 5. She said it was. I could trust Darius, he was a good lad from a good family, so I did it. We drove for about an hour and I could tell from the bumpiness of the ride that we were well off the beaten track. And when we finally stopped, Darius, who is very, very nice, by the way, studying for a degree in medicine and going out with a lovely sounding girl called Yoko, said I could take the blindfold off and he apologised yet again for me having to wear it. And we were in the middle of a forest, tall trees all around us. I didn't even know we had that kind of woodlands near Manchester. Just goes to show, doesn't it? Anyway, Darius goes over and blows this massive horn. Eight foot tall it was, just standing there. I mean, normally you'd worry about some idiot nicking it or graffitiing the thing. I got the feeling we were somewhere that kind of idiot couldn't find. Darius had explained in the car that his dad Milo was a hundred years old. Or at least that's what I thought he'd said. Turns out that's not what a centaur is. 
what it is is somebody who's sort of half man, half horse. The top bit is the man bit, I hasten to add. A horse's top running about a man's legs would be very odd. Then again, I'll probably see it eventually. We waited and after a few minutes, Milo trotted into the clearing. God, he was incredible looking. Long white hair running down his back, thick beard, and blue eyes that were piercingly intense. He was also topless and, well, let's just say, not a hint of dad bod. There was steam rising off the muscles on his torso and the, the horse bit looked, well, you know, like a horse. They're probably shorter than the average horse, now think of it. M more like a pony. He seemed very annoyed to see Darius and he proper glared at me. Darius pulled him aside and they had a chat with Darius doing most of the talking and I could see from the off Milo was not a happy camper. He stomped his hooves a few times and they spoke for a few minutes and then Milo huffs and puffs before heading over behind some bushes. And Darius takes out one of them suit carrier bags from the back of his car and holds it up beside the bushes only to have it snatched out of his hands. By this point Darius can see I am looking a bit nervous. So he comes over and he whispers, Oh, don't worry about Dad, he's been out here quite a while in centaur form and it takes a while to come back to thinking like a human after the transformation. Plus, I've just told him that one of his oldest friends has died. I was just about to ask what he meant by transformation when Milo walks out from behind the bushes and, I mean, walks. Looks like a fella. More or less an ordinary man. And one that wears the hell out of a suit. The horse bit's gone, don't ask me, I've got no idea. And the only way you can tell it's the same man is the hair and the beard's all still there and in need of a good trim. And Darius takes a stool out of the car boot, Milo nearly bites him when he sits him on it, and then he goes in a dead growly low voice, who's this woman you bring here to the most sacred of places? And Darius explains she's a friend of Yvonne's and Lady Winifred has personally vouched for her. I can see Milo still isn't happy. But clearly, my credentials are in order. Darius whispers in his ear and waves me forward and I get me scissors and comb out and off we go. It's not fun. Turns out running around in a forest half naked while very mysterious and all that leaves your long flowing locks a tangled mess. I'm trying to comb through it and he's pulling away, snarling. I mean, he's actually snarling at me. And Darius is smiling apologetically and wincing through the whole thing. Eventually, after he nearly pulls the comb out of my hand, I down tools and stand right in front of Milo and I waggle my finger in his face and say, Right, mister, I appreciate you're having a bad day, but I am just here to get you right for your friend's funeral. You can either help me do that or I can bugger off home. The choice is entirely yours. Well, he furrows his brows and he gives me a right uffy look. But he nods and after that we get the job done. By the end, he looks very tidy, if I do say so myself. Mission accomplished. We get in the car, I put my blindfold back on and Darius drops me back home and that was that, as far as I was concerned. Not the weirdest job. Hell, not even the weirdest that week. I've been in a wetsuit in a lake on Wednesday. Anyway, two days after that, the doorbell rings and who is it? It's only Milo, standing there on my doorstep, still wearing a suit, not a hoof in sight. I thought you better not be here to complain. Although the fact he's holding a large bunch of flowers makes me think he's probably not. And sure enough, he hands me the bouquet and says in a much softer voice than he'd used previously, Madam, I'm here to beg your forgiveness. My behaviour when we first met was appalling. I was not at my best and I've just received shocking news, but none of that is an excuse. Please accept my humble apologies. I'll tell you what. I've not received that many apologies in my life, certainly not as many as I should have done. But that, that was a doozy. All is forgotten, I said, and then I offered him a cuppa. But he said he got to rush off, and I see that Darius is in the car out front waiting for him. So, what was it that I said about Karma being a bitch? Well, when she's on your side, she's the best mate in the world, because who pulls up at that moment? It's only Darren. As I'm saying my goodbyes, he's coming up the drive and I can see him looking at Milo like, who the hell's this guy? As Milo was saying his farewells and being very charming, Darren rushes up and interrupts going, we need to talk. And I said, Darren, 
I've got nothing to say to you. Speak to my lawyer. He says, I'm coming in and we're talking. And Milo takes half a step, you know, just half a step, and puts himself in Darren's path and very quietly he says, the lady doesn't want to talk to you. Now Darren, like most blokes, has always considered himself to be Andy in a fight. Men are like gambling addicts when it comes to violence. Any fight they win is skill, and if they lose, it's pure bad luck. Still, Darren locks eyes with Milo, and then after a couple of seconds, he looks away. He wants to say something, but anybody can see he's lost his bottle. He skulks off back to his car. Darius is standing beside his now, and I can see him smirking at Darren as he scurries off, tail between his legs. He waits till he's in his car, big brave man, and then as he's driving off, he shouts, And this isn't over! I'm going to ring you! Well, I won't answer, I shout back. I'm a bit embarrassed and I say, Oh, sorry, Milo, that idiot is my soon-to-be ex-husband. You were clearly right to get rid of him, he says. And I go, Actually, it was him that walked out on me. Milo then looks at me and he says, I didn't think my opinion of him could be any lower, but I was wrong. I tell you what, I'm no giddy teenager, but right at that point, I got a proper flutter. Darius then calls his dad and says he need to get moving, and I wave him goodbye, my bouquet of flowers in my hand. After that, a couple of weeks go by. Darren tried to ring me. I blocked him. He didn't drop around again, and as for Milo, well, I'm not going to lie, I did think about him a couple of times. I mean, I'm a liberated woman, but it was lovely having a gentleman give an apology, a proper apology, and then defend my honour. I'm just saying I've had worse days. A few weeks later, I get a call asking me to come and do a job up near Glossop. To be honest, I could have done without it because I've been up half the night with Rory going gaga about something outside, probably a fox. But the woman on the phone really pleads with me, says her granny's got a 90th birthday, she won't go because her hair's a mess. So all right, I say, and I head out, I bring Rory with me because he's acting very out of character. And I'm wondering if he's got a dodgy tummy or he's gone and eaten something inedible again. I drive out just past Glossop, it took nearly an hour, only to get to the address and the people there have got no idea what I'm talking about. There's no grannies to be found, it's just a young couple with a baby. I ring the number that rang me and it's only a bloody phone box. It occurs to me it might be Darren playing silly buggers. Trying to mess with my business is something he would do and Carol is definitely this petty and a lot more besides. Screw them, I think. They must be getting desperate if they're resorting to cheap tricks like this. From now on, deposit up front. I get back in the van after letting Rory out for a quick wee and we head off home. It's a glorious sunny day and we'll enjoy the lovely mountain views as we drive home. So, who is the loser here? Turns out it really is me. Luckily, I'm no Lewis Hamilton behind the wheel, so I'm only in third and going under 30 miles an hour when I touch the brake as I'm coming up to a slight bend in the road and nothing happens. Something is wrong, very wrong. I press down hard, the car doesn't slow down. Instead, I hear some kind of noise, like a horrible clunking sound, like something important's broken. My bloody brakes had failed on one of the most dangerous roads in Britain. Not only that, but the clutch is having no effects. I can't shift gear either. It's only when I realise that taking my foot completely off the accelerator doesn't slow the car down that I really start to panic. They close snakes pass in the winter, and even in summer you've got to be careful as it's really windy in places and I am in a right panic now. I try putting the handbrake on, but it just slows me down a little bit. It's downhill all the way from here in more ways than one. We get round the first gradual bend and I'm honking the horn like crazy, trying to make other drivers aware. There's a car in front of me, a little mini, and I think, oh Christ, oh Christ, I'm going to end up running somebody off the road. We're coming to a much more pronounced turn and I know the mini's going to slow down. Traffic on the other side of the road isn't heavy at that time of the day, but it comes in waves and I can't see where the next wave's coming because of the bend. Absent of any other option, I hold my breath, pull into the oncoming lane and do a ridiculous overtaking manoeuvre, getting back over just in time to avoid hitting a minibus coming the other way around the bend. And still as I'm turning, the front of the van is scraping against the metal barrier, sending sparks up. The good news is, after the bend, I'm on a straight bit for a while as a bridge goes over the reservoir. The bad news is, well, 
everything else. The van's going like the clappers now, and at the end of this stretch of road, there's a sharp turn. And if I don't make it, there is solid rock on one side. And before that, there's deep water on both sides of me. My goose is well and truly cooked. In my head, I've gone, this is it, Jackie. And my second to last thought is, Darren, you utter bastard. And my last thought's Rory, poor Rory, yapping away beside me in the front seat. I open the window, grab him by the collar and throw him towards the water, thinking that's the best landing. When he's snatched out of the air. And that's because galloping beside the van, it's only bloody Milo. In horsey form, obviously. Jump, he shouts. I look at the rock wall coming towards me and I think, oh, well, in for a penny. I unbuckle, open the door, close my eyes and jump. Strong arms catching me is the last thing I remember as for the first time in my life I proper faint. When I come round I'm lying a few yards back from the edge of the road with Rory licking me face and an ambulance crew kneeling around me. Milo is nowhere to be seen but the fire brigade is putting out the burning husks of my lovely new van. Some of the stuff in the back is pretty flammable so that thing really caught a light. The EMTs are checking me out and I wonder if I've imagined the whole thing. Except I look at the hill and there, in the tree line, I can make out a figure standing in the shadows looking down at me. The rest of the evening is taken up. First we go into hospital to be checked over, then giving statements to the police. And they haul in Darren and Carol. They sod all proof they did it, but as it happens, it doesn't matter. Because as soon as they question, they both blame the other person for the whole thing. It happens that fast that they're both in custody by the time a nice couple of coppers are dropping me home at 11. Rory's growling at something in the darkness as I'm waving goodbye to the officers and fishing me spare keys out from under that rock. I don't even look round. I don't need to, because I can sense his presence. So, I say... How come you were there? Milo, who was now back in man-in-suit mode, stepped out from behind the trees by the side gate. And he hesitates before saying, I was following you, you know. Well, watching over you, I mean. Thank you very much, but why were you doing that? It's your ex. He smelled. I turn my head and look directly at him after he says that. I'm sorry. It's hard to explain. We centaurs, we can smell human intent. And he had bad intentions. Right, I say, well, it must make you very good at poker. You best come in for that cup of tea. And he did. In fact, Milo has been coming around for quite a few cups of tea, some of which have lasted all night. And occasionally, I give him treatments that are very definitely not part of the standard package. Thank you for listening to the Stranger Times podcast. If you've enjoyed it, then please leave a rating wherever you get your pods. It really does help. And the Stranger Times novel by C.K. MacDonald is out and is available from all good bookshops and some bad ones. And check out strangertimes.com for more weird news and to sign up to the newsletter where you can also get yourself a sweet free ebook containing some Stranger Times short stories. This podcast is produced by Rob B at BEE, with Ed Wilson exec producing, and all materials are copyright McFory Inc. Limited. All of the short stories are written by me, CK McDonald, and the music is done by Alan McGuire with John McCullough as musical Sven Galley. <laughs> <laughs>